Don, favor us with your dissertation, will you? Lighten us up on your experiences. He's enthusiastic about this, you can see that. <laughs> I, I feel like the condemned man. Um, We're going to make it easy for you. Let's bring on Don. Uh, I'm reminded uh, when I was a, a sophomore at university, I had switched over from uh, aeronautical to engineering to mechanical engineering because aeronautical engineers at that time were not were not finding uh, jobs very well. And uh, one of our courses was one uh, called technical discussion, which is really a speech course. I suppose it was the idea that uh, you could give presentations, technical presentations. But our instructor was a fellow by the name of Robert Lippert, and he uh, had been a first sergeant in the Army. And uh, most of his... Uh, uh, I was going to say his uh, dissertation, but almost like commands, was in a very loud voice. And uh, one of the first things you had to do was get up and talk about yourself. And uh, I think that's probably the most embarrassing thing in the world, to get up and talk about when you're born and what you did. And because it, even at that age, uh, uh, I was 21 then and uh, 22, and, and I didn't really want to talk about the, the war experiences, so I kind of limited it to uh, the experiences that I, you know, before the war. Um, born in St. Paul, Minnesota. Grew up, went to high school. Um, uh, and my younger, my, my father was the uh, first Air Force manager at Home and Field. And so from the time I was about nine or ten years old, he spent a lot of time uh, at the airport with him. Uh, his office was next to, uh, was, uh, was built on to one of the uh, uh, the only private, or I should say private, uh, uh, general aviation hangar. And so I had a chance to be around airplanes since I was pretty young. Uh, later on, I learned to, to fuel them and uh, push them around, bring them in, and uh, and then eventually work with some mechanics on the maintenance of them. Um, I started taking flying lessons in, uh, in September 1941 and sold uh, a J3 Cup on October 4th. And uh, 64 days afterwards uh, was the, uh, the December 7th uh, uh, fiasco at uh, Pearl Harbor. And they stopped all the private flying. And um, the National Guard had been taken, uh, had been federalized, of course, and so the state form had formed a, a secondary militia called the Home Guard. And so the, they had those, uh, they were called at active duty, and they were stationed at all the airports around the uh, area. And, uh, and in order to, uh, and while the private flight was stopped, what the uh, CAA did in those days, which was the forerunner of the FAA, decided that everyone had to carry an identification card. It was called the Airman's Identification Card, and it was uh, anyone who was a pilot, uh, starting with a student and on up, um, uh, and, and people who worked on the aircraft, people around the, the airport said, oh, have to have the fingerprinted, yeah, fingerprinted and a photo on this card. Um, interesting thing about the card is that yeah, they said when you, uh, if you entered the armed, for source, the armed forces, you were supposed to send it back to the, uh, the CAA, which I did. And I completely forgot about it. And about 1969, one day, I got a, an envelope from the uh, FAA office in Oklahoma City. And then it was uh, my student license and uh, the Air, Airman's identification card. But no letter, no nothing, it just, just stuck in an envelope. I, I suppose they were cleaning out their, uh, their, their files or something. But uh, it was kind of a surprise. Um, uh, I, as I said, the flying was stopped, and I didn't get my uh, identification card until I think it was sometime in April or May in 1942. And course, by that time, most of the private flying had been taken over for what they started in what was called the war. Uh, uh, the War Service, and uh, the uh, Air Force used the Army Air Force used this these, uh, this War Service training to give uh, flight training to uh, uh, fellows that were going to be become uh, cadets. Uh, they, they I think they finished out the uh, civilian pilot training for a while, and then later they uh, went into this War Service thing. Later on, when I went to a college training detachment up in Michigan. Uh, we, we flew 10 hours in uh, Taylor Crafts and uh, Irankas. Uh, there was no solo flight allowed, but uh, we put 10, uh, 10 hours uh, dual flying with, uh, with them. 
Well, anyway, I, uh, I graduated from high school. I, uh, I got a job that summer working at, uh, at uh, Northwest Airlines and their modification centers in St. Paul. And uh, at that time, the B-24s uh, were being built at uh, Willow Run. Uh, that uh, big production was starting. And rather than make uh, uh, changes in the aircraft, they would send them to the modification centers. And this was kind of universal throughout the war. Uh, I know there was one for the B-17 at uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming. And for those who've flown B-17s, uh, later ones, they had a, a uh, they put a, 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 a manual <laughs> turret on the tail. It was called the Cheyenne turret. And it was, uh, those were put on uh, apparently at, at Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, the planes would come in and, and we uh, one of the things, the first things we do is took out the, what they had put in the oxygen systems were high pressure oxygen bottles. And uh, someone realized that uh, these are under 2,000 pounds pressure and if, if this was hit by a bullet or some other piece of flak, uh, that uh, uh, cylinder would take off like a rocket. So they, we took them all out and put in the low pressure tanks, which were uh, about 450 pound uh, tanks uh, that, that they used during the war. Other things, a lot of the waste that came without waste guns, without nose guns, it was uh, in the rear of the uh, B-24, there was a, a rear hatch back towards the, the past the waste, and uh, they put a, what they call a tunnel gun in there. They put a, uh, the door was, uh, was put in you know, with a plastic, with plexiglass, and then in the center was a uh, flexible mount for uh, uh, putting in the uh, uh, handheld 50 caliber machine gun. That was before the days that they had uh, power turrets in the front of the, the all the guns in the B-24 at the beginning were, were flexible guns, uh, and the, later on, of course, they put the turret there. The, the tail was, uh, was flexible gun. They had a tail turret, and the ball turret against it was was put in there. So that was after I only worked that summer, and uh, a lot of times we'd, we'd work. Uh, I worked the uh, evening shift. that worked from three to midnight. And uh, sometimes we didn't have any airplanes. I mean, the, 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 the plane was, the field was almost empty, except for maybe a few that needed flight testing. <coughs> I could never understand why they kept us there, but later found out that uh, if you worked in a place and if they sent you home, you could uh, leave that job and go to uh, find a, a better paying uh, job in the war production thing. And they wanted to hold the people there. So even though we didn't, sometimes didn't have much to do, we had, still had to report to work and used to tell us not to hide from the timekeepers, uh, which I suppose were, I don't know if they were federal employees or not, but anyway, that was our thing. All the, air, the work was done outside, and it was uh, during the, after I left in, in September, they they started to build uh, those big hangars that you see at Toma Field up on the northeast corner, which is now mostly the 3M has, uh, has their flight operation out of it. Um, I really wanted to uh, uh, get in the service after high school, but my father really uh, put a lot of pressure on me to go on to school. He said, well, Don, he said, it's going to be a long war. And uh, if you go in without any education, he said, uh, it isn't, it isn't, so, it isn't so good that way. He was uh, he was in the Navy himself as an air, aircraft mechanic in the Naval Service. And uh, he, my dad never finished uh, beyond the eighth grade. And I think he, he thought that, you know, we should all have as much education. So I did. Um, and registered for the university and uh, engineering school, and I wanted to join the Naval uh, Reserve there. And um, after uh, after having the, the physical and felt I was going to get in, they they turned me down. And uh, I asked them why, and they said, "Well, you have what we call a, a malocclusion, which means that you're when you bite your teeth, it not come together top and bottom." Well, I didn't think I looked like Bugs Bunny or, or Elmer Snurd. But, uh, and I went and talked to my dentist, and he said, well, I can't understand that, why that, that certainly wouldn't incapacitate you for anything. So he wrote a letter and uh, gave it to me, and, uh, and I took it to the uh, naval uh, representative at, at the university. And he said, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. He said, uh, the, the chief dentist from uh, Great Lakes is coming up in about uh, a couple of weeks, and uh, um, we'll have you see him and see what, whether he'll, uh, he'll pass you. Well, that happened, and uh, and uh, he wouldn't pass it, so uh, I was out of it. But this time, I had turned to be 18 years and six months. Uh, my birthday was the, in April 14th, and so by the middle of October, 
uh, I was 18 and a half years, and the, uh, they had started something with the, uh, with the enlistment that after you turned 18 years and six months, you could no longer enlist. You had to go through the uh, selective service. So uh, I wanted to get into the uh, Army uh, program there, and uh, they said, no, you can't do that. Um, you missed out. Uh, you should have started, you know, when school started, so you could start in, in the spring. But I knew that then that I probably was going to go in the service, so I stayed. And I did uh, two quarters at the uh, of engineering school and started the, the, the uh, spring quarter, and then I got my notice to report for induction. And I was in, inducted in the Army at uh, Fort Snelling. And I went through the, uh, the normal uh, uh, physical and everything else. And I had told the, uh, the Army doctor that I w would like to uh, qualify as, a, as the aviation cadet. And he, he said, well, I can give you an abbreviated 6-4 exam, which was mostly checking your eyesight uh, more than anything else, although you, you know, it checks your heart and all the other stuff. And uh, they said, well, yeah, you're qualified, so what you do is you wait till you go to basic training and then apply. And so after a couple of weeks, I was sent to uh, the uh, uh, Army Air Force uh, uh, number one training center at uh, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, right outside of St. South of St. Louis, Missouri. And while I was there, I applied for the cadet program. And when I finished uh, training, they said, well, you, you, you're, you're accepted, except you have to appear before a uh, board of officers and uh, that won't convene for a couple of weeks, so we're going to send you on to uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, they sent me there to a, a aircraft engine mechanic school, uh, in which I uh, worked uh, that summer on uh, Allison and uh, Rolls-Royce, Packard Rolls-Royce engines. I was going to say Rolls-Royce, but I really should say Packard, because uh, Packard took over the, uh, the building of the Rolls-Royce engine. and. It's not the same Rolls Royce that uh, the British made. Uh, they made a lot of improvements in it, and particularly they redesigned it so it could be uh, mass produced uh, much much faster. Um, sometime late in August, I got I got the word that I was to report back to Jefferson Barracks. They had a, a class, what they call a classification center, they had set up, and this was to give you um, uh, uh, tests very psychological. They talked with a psychiatrist and, and they had a bunch of motor tests to, to test your uh, your coordination. Uh, I remember one was following a little bug going around in a circle and uh, I, I think that was, someone said that's for training for bombardiers, but I don't know that. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I was there until about early in, no, sometime in November, early in November, and then they uh, decided to send us to what they call the college training detachments. Now, anyone who hadn't, uh, at first the uh, Air Force was taking uh, people right out of high school but for cadet training. But later on, they decided, I think when they got the numbers caught up a little bit, decided that if you hadn't had at least two years of college, they would send you off to one of these uh, uh, college training detachments. And I was posted to the 98th training detachment at Houghton, Michigan, which is up on the Keweenaw Point of uh, Northern Michigan sticks out in the middle of Lake Superior. And um, we went there for, I was there for five months for the training. And like I said before, we did uh, 10 hours of flight training. And these were in uh, Aronka and uh, Tittercraft aircraft, 65 horse engine on both of them. Um, we finished the training and, and we were waiting for orders to go to pre-flight. And we were part of the Western Training Command. So we were to be sent to uh, Santa Ana, California which was the center for pre-flight. And uh, uh, we didn't have any, we didn't get any orders to go and we had nothing to do and a new class had come in uh, for to replace us. And so uh, after standing roll call in the morning, they, they said, well, you're free to leave the, leave the, uh, the campus and you could, we could go to town or do whatever we wanted. We had to be report back at uh, 10 o'clock at night. And, uh, uh, it was an interesting course there. They, they taught uh, mathematics, physics, uh, geography, uh, English, of course. And uh, it was strange because uh, the geography course, while they, uh, they devoted some attention to Europe, most of it was on Japan. Uh, Japan. And we had to really memorize the, uh, the, the, the names of all the Japanese islands and their location. So I think 
we kind of realized that maybe if we got back into the into the war, we're going to probably be going to the Far East. After a couple of weeks of laying around not doing much, we got a we got a call to go down to the day room, and the and the, uh, and the uh, detachment commander, a captain, and and the sergeant, uh, first sergeant, came in and they passed out a, a little uh, mimeograph paper, and it was a, a letter from the commanding general of the Western Training uh, Command saying that due to the changes in the logistics of war that uh, our services as cadets were, were not needed. And so therefore we would be, uh, the program, our, we'd be terminated at the convenience of the government, which meant uh, without prejudice, they said. And I said, well, what does that mean? Well, that means if the, if the need grows again, you could, uh, you, could be, you could get back in the program. And after a week or two, kind of uh, around there, they finally got ordered six of us were, or five or six of us were sent by, uh, uh, by rail to uh, uh, the gunnery school at Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, the ones they kept in the program were, it were uh, young men who came directly, uh, were younger, they were probably just past 18, that came in the service uh, as right in as cadets and after their basic training went into the uh, college training detachment program. They stayed, and uh, the rest of the people in the, that were uh, in our squadron were either a lot of them came from some of them were uh, fellows who had were, had quite a bit of enlisted rank. They were sent back to the ground forces if they if that's where they came from, um, because my enlisted, uh, initial assignment was the air was the Air Corps. Why uh, we stayed in and went to gunnery school. We got to Las Vegas. They, there were so many people coming in from these programs that were canceled. I think we had to wait about six weeks to get into the program. And the program was only about six weeks long anyway. And there we learned about uh, to be aerial gunners and are finished up around the 1st of July. And we had 10, delay, 10 days delay en route to go home and reach our next duty station, which again happened to be Lincoln, Nebraska. Now Lincoln, Nebraska, they had closed the, uh, the mechanic school and now it was a uh, center for uh, forming flight crews and that's where our flight crews for, for operational training were made, and uh, after a week or so, I, I was assigned to a, uh, an air crew, and um, uh, went out to operational training at Alexandria, Louisiana, for about 18 weeks. Um, uh, we had, uh, of course, the radio operator had a had a, 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 had, a had his, his spot. The tail, and the, so the tail gun, the, uh, the waist guns, and the uh, ball turret were the ones that were open to what we call career gunners. People who were strictly gunners that didn't have, that weren't either armors or radio operators or flight engineers. And the top turret was result, was reserved, I guess, for um, for, for the uh, flight engineer. Uh, something I couldn't understand because I went to gunnery school. Uh, when I finished, they said, "Well, you're a top turret specialist," and I had only, I think, I'd only been in the ball turret, I guess, once. But after getting on the crew, I, uh, no one really wanted to go in the ball shirt. And uh, we were all about the same height and stature. Normally the ball shirt was, was usually for shorter men, but uh, I was five foot, almost five foot 10 at that time. And uh, that's why I got finally decided either I had to take that or I had to go back and uh, go back through the whole thing. And then I, I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I thought, well, I think I'll stick with it. So I finished the training, went overseas, went back, to, by the way, went back to Lincoln Nebraska was now, was now a staging area also, and um, we got our flight gear and our shots and all the stuff that we were overseas. We went to uh, uh, Fort Dix in New Jersey, and after a week or so, got on the Queen Mary and went, went across, or the Queen Elizabeth, and went across to uh, five days across to, to Scotland. And from there, we went down and I joined the uh, 303rd Bomb Bombardment Group uh, at Molesworth, England. And, um, the 303rd was one of the early four groups that were posted in England that did most of the flying. And at the end of 1942, in the early part of 43, while the other groups were, were getting uh, up and running and getting into into combat readiness, so they used to call them the Four Horsemen because they called the Four Squadron to the 92nd, the 303rd, the 305th, and the 306th. So they did the early the early on missions. Uh, a lot of them were into uh, occupied France.